Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we do our normal Friday routine wrap the week where we focus on the message of the markets from last Friday to this Friday. Now, there has been plenty of movement during this week with distribution days on Tuesday and Wednesday, back to accumulation phase on Thursday, and then definitely today with upside follow through led by energy and tech. What we're going to look at is how the markets have really changed from last Friday to this Friday. And what should we think about going forward? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us after the close every weekday as we break down the activity in the markets. In a week like this, I would argue there's no better thing than charts to help you make sense of things. Uh, things have gone from desperate to euphoric, from incredibly negative to incredibly positive, depending on what point of what day you're looking at. And that, I think, is the environment that we're in. We look at elevated volatility when we talk about increased uncertainty. It creates days and weeks like we're seeing uh, right now. And today, certainly, if you were looking for an indication that all is not lost, that things are still okay, that there is a sign, there are signs of life in things like technology and communications names, uh, hopefully today gave you a, a little bit of that of that sense of uh, of optimism. The question, though, is what's the long-term trend? And that's what today's show, that's what Friday's show is usually about, looking at the long-term trends and how they've evolved. And to be honest with you, as a preview, it's mixed. But let's look at the evidence here together in a little bit. Now, we had some really good guests this week. I was super excited to have some of the conversations with uh, with Chris Brecher and, uh, and uh, um, Jay Soloff and others. Uh, a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, next week on Tuesday, we have Joe Rabel from Rabel Stock Research. Uh, joining us. And then on Thursday, the 20th, we have Katie Stockton from Fairlead Strategies. Also, two other events to point out to you. Coming up the week of May 24th, we have a special series of shows called Chart School Idea Generation. Chart School is one of the more popular parts of Stock Charts website. This is where people go to learn about investing, technical analysis, and uh, decision making, all of that. We have a lot of free resources there to help you along the way. We are going to feature a different expert every day sharing with you how they use the scanning engine to generate new equity ideas in an environment like this, but no better time to try to make sense of things and, and help look at what's working and what isn't. Also coming up on May 27th, our next episode of The Pitch. This is where we have three guest experts that share their five stock picks each. Then we have a debate uh, where we uh, sort of uh, discuss the merits and weaknesses of some of those different uh, picks. It's been a really great series. We've had some really fun conversations and ideas that come out of it. You will leave with a list of tickers to uh, dig into a little more. That's coming up on May 27th, the pitch. Let's get to our Wrap the Week segment where we focus on the evolution of the markets this week. First, I want to hit a poll. We always have a poll running on our Stock Charts TV live stream page, but also on social media. We'll put it out as well. Do us a favor and uh, answer the poll anytime you can. Uh, helps us to think uh, as a group about what we're seeing and what we're thinking. We asked which asset class performs best through June 30th, 2021. So basically the next six weeks or so, sort of finishing the second quarter. 35% of you said stocks, but the overwhelming winner was gold. 49% of you, almost half, said gold out of all of these things. Uh, below that, well below that, you sort of had a tie for bonds at 9%, the dollar at uh, at 7%. So overall, what's interesting, a couple observations, you know, if you're thinking about stocks versus bonds, and we're going to look at that chart here in a little bit in today's show, uh, you know, clearly people favoring stocks over bonds, if you're looking at it too, and that's absolutely right. That's what the trends would absolutely justify. Gold being so high relative to stocks is interesting. And I bet if we ask that same question starting today, I'm wondering how much those percentages were changed based on the run we had higher in stocks today. I think that's sucking a lot of investors in, arguably could be a bear market rally, or it could be the resumption of this uptrend that we've been in for months and months and years and years. Let's look at the charts together here in our Wrap the Week segment and see how the markets have actually evolved. 
We're going to look right now at the weekly change in these different asset classes. Then we'll look at just today's movements. And then we'll finish off looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list to really focus on uh, you know, some of the long-term trends and how they've evolved. And again, I, my goal with the Mindful Investor Live chart list is to do that 30,000 foot view, really make sense of things big picture wise. Now, looking at this last week, what actually happened? Again, a lot of movement at the end of the day with the nice rally today, following through the nice rally yesterday, the S&P was still down 1.3% from last Friday. So before we get too excited about the raging uptrend that the, uh, the S&P 500 has now embarked on in the last 48 hours, s and still down week on week. So it was, a, it was a weaker move for stocks. Now, what outperformed stocks this week? The U.S. dollar, which was essentially flat, about 0.1% above zero. Gold and crude oil were essentially even at plus 0.6%. And again, that's using the uh, dollar sign USO, uh, the crude oil uh, ETF. And then D GLD for, the, uh, for gold and the UUP for the dollar index is what we're using for each of those. But overall, all of those net positive for the week. What underperformed? Well, bonds were actually about even for stocks today. They had been outperforming as of Thursday, but the move higher in the S&P sort of uh, eclipsed it. But bonds were down one and a half percent. Small caps down just about 2% this week. And NASDAQ down 2.3%. Uh, Again, that's with uh, today's rally that uh, outperformed the S&P, still down 2.3%. Emerging markets, the big loser, down 3.2% for the week. If you're wondering where Bitcoin is, we add that to the mix. It's way down here at the bottom, down 12%. And you know we've talked about the, uh, the chart of cryptocurrencies. And, and it's in interesting. Today, you have Ethereum up double-digit percentages. Last time I, I checked... Uh, but Bitcoin overall uh, relatively weak this week, and this is after you know essentially most of this week was uh, was seeing a lower move there. There's a real challenge, I think, with things like Bitcoin, you know, and, and other cryptocurrencies. The question is the sustainability of those runs, and and I would say it's hard to argue that cryptocurrencies are fueled by speculation. Meaning, you're betting if you're betting on Bitcoin going higher, you're betting on there being an additional source of buyers that keep wanting to invest money in Bitcoin. And the bull case is that we've still not even scratched the surface of the unlimited demand that could build for something like a, a Bitcoin or Ethereum. The bear case, of course, is what we're seeing play out this week is at some point people are done buying it. There's no one left. And all of a sudden we realize that we speculated pretty high on something that's not justifying those levels just yet. So it was a bit of a, a come back to earth moment. I think the Bitcoin chart overall, fairly distributive, uh, but we'll have to see uh, how these things play out over time. Very quickly, just on the main themes uh, today, and then we'll finish off looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. The S&P finished today up 1.5%. And again, after yesterday, which is a bit of a transition day from Wednesday's you know, bloodbath, severe downturn to rally mode, today we uh, continue to push higher. Now, yesterday I published a video calling this a dead cat bounce. And I, I, I still would argue you could call this uh, the end of a dead cat bounce if Monday goes lower. That's a big if. And if not, I think you have to acknowledge that that was not the case, but I saw the signs of a big down thrust and then an up move yesterday into uh, into today. Overall, that tells me weaker rather than stronger, but a day like today certainly feels more optimistic and you're seeing people buy into the buy the dip strategy similar to what we saw in June. Small caps up 2.2%, mid caps outperforming as well, up 1.7%. The VIX is back below 20 now, below 19 even. Very quickly on other asset classes, yields lower today. So we talked about the rising yields and sort of the stabilization of the of, of interest rates uh, sort of sideways. And again, inflation fears would mean interest rates most likely going higher. We did not see that through the course of the of this week here with uh, with yields back down around 164 on the 10-year. Uh, the dollar index, by the way, down about 0.4% today. Commodities overall, certainly in a long-term uptrend, gold continuing to push higher uh, today. So again, anytime I see people think about stocks and golds moving inversely and implying that gold is a safe haven that moves inversely to stocks, I point at days like today where stocks and gold can go up together, they can go down together. As much as we think there's a a, a you know a one-on-one -on -one uh, positive correlation between the two. It's just not the case. The data really doesn't support that. I would always consider them independently. And gold overall is working as are uh, our other precious metals like silver. Finally, cryptocurrencies across the board up today. Now, again, this week was pretty rough for most cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is nearing the 50,000 level, which is a, you know, certainly a level that, uh, that, that felt like it was in the rear view mirror permanently. But now we've tested 
you know, the lower uh, below there a couple of times with uh, with uh, Bitcoin getting down to 47,000 uh, during the day on Thursday. So overall and leading into this morning. So overall, it's certainly something to uh, to watch Ethereum continuing to outperform Bitcoin. And many have speculated sort of eclipsing it as the uh, more promising of the major uh, cryptos to follow. Uh, but we can focus on the charts for sure. Today, by the way, in terms of the uh, sector rotation, energy up big today, up over 3%, followed by technology, communication services, consumer discretionary. This is back to that, the FANG trade uh, working just fine today. What was underperforming, everything else was up, uh, but healthcare uh, up just a bit, uh, consumer staples, utilities, all sort of at the bottom of the list. These are the more defensive parts of the market. Uh, so on a day like today where you're moving pretty high, pretty quick, uh, not unreasonable to see those. And by the way, if you look at the stocks gaining the most, a lot of travel names, things like cruise lines, uh, airlines, Delta, United, some of the biggest gainers in the uh, in the scooter reports, TripAdvisor as well. Uh, other uh, buckets would be the um, uh, hard drive makers, right? Western Digital, Seagate Technologies, both up uh, significantly today. But again, the challenge I have with any of those charts is they bounced really well today. That's impressive. A 5% move is great. But overall, I'm still seeing this as a downturn. We're still making lower highs and higher and lower lows, excuse me. So until that pattern changes, as much as the day like today is a nice bounce, I see it more as a bounce until you make a higher low. That's what we've not seen on a chart like Delta. Let's continue on and look at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. As a reminder, you can get to this from my homepage on Stock Charts. Just go to the articles page, search for my blog, which is called The Mindful Investor, and you will see a link to this chart list right at the top of your screen. Starting at the very top with the, uh, the market trend model. This is a weekly model that I've been following for uh, years and really tries to encapsulate the overall trend in stocks. Looking at three time frames: long term, medium term, and short term, you can see that even with the uh, the, the downtrend that you saw uh, Tuesday to Wednesday, the recover that we saw Thursday, and then especially today, made the short term model remain bullish. And I uh, earlier this week, it seemed highly likely that you would get a short term bearish signal there because the S and P was below its five week exponential moving average. It closed almost to the penny to that level. Uh, so not quite registering a sell signal yet. Overall, this is telling you in all time frames the trend remains positive. And again, I don't have a huge problem with that given the fact that we're you know, less than a week now or about a week off of all time highs. However, certainly the weakness you saw on Wednesday uh, certainly made it feel like things were getting very distributed very quickly. The S&P breaking 4120, by the way, is one of the key things we talked about, which happened. What we did not get after that breakdown, by the way, was a follow through, right? So for me, it's all about, do you break a key level? We did that uh, on Wednesday when you broke below the 4120 level. That's a line in the sand uh, here in pink that we've talked about. For me, every time we break, it's all about the follow through. Do you get that follow through indicating it wasn't just a, a one-time thing. This is more of a broader uh, decline or more of a broader uh, move. That's what we did not get yesterday. Thursday's session was more of a recovery, sort of staying within the previous day's range. I actually call that a bullish Harami pattern. If you're studying your candlestick patterns, look that one up. It's a short-term positive signal. So again, the bounce further to the upside today, again, makes perfect sense to me. This combination of the S&P hitting its 50-day moving average, hitting trend line support, this major trend line, the RSI bouncing off 40 uh, a bullish Harami pattern, all of that tells you Friday should should probably go higher, which it did. I still could see this as a dead cap bounce. The way you validate that is by breaking down through uh, this uh, the support level. So I think Wednesday's low becomes very, very important. The moving average, the 50 day moving average, the uh, trend line support, all incredibly important. Watching those going into next week is going to be one of the main things I'm going to be doing. Let's continue on here looking at breadth and then sentiment. Breadth overall conditions remain very strong. There are certain breadth indicators looking less than ideal. We might hit one of those here in a second, uh, but overall the cumulative advanced decline lines continue to be strong, making higher highs and higher lows. This is not updated for today's close just yet, but most likely you'll see these uh, bounce back up just fine. The small cap advanced decline line, by the way, went below its 50 day just for one day, but came right back above it. So you're really still seeing that the broad uh, advance is still in in uh, in good shape. Uh, as the S and P broke up or bounced back above its 50-day moving average, the question is the new highs and the new lows. You're starting to see a handful of new lows, uh, which shows you the the pullback that you've had or the drop that you've had in some of the New York Stock Exchange names. The S and P overall still broadly uh, very, very positive, of course. 
Now, part of the long-term bullish thesis in my argument are these blue arrows and expansion and new highs. As the market's going higher, you want an increasing number of stocks making new highs. That shows you that not just are stocks bouncing, like you're seeing from the airlines and from the cruise lines today, but you're seeing stocks actually materially move higher, move above a previous resistance level. And that tells you conditions are positive. That tells you the trend is good. And the expanding new highs uh, has been a very much part of, the, uh, part of the, the strength of the market. That completely changed this week as most stocks now below their 52-week high given the pullback. Now they rallied today, but, uh, but again, not enough to really register a lot of new highs I would not expect. The question going into next week is you get a, another expansion to new highs. That would be something to watch as well. Now, where you all getting are getting some negative divergences here with the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. That's the green panel you see at the very bottom here. You see with the red arrow back in January, how the market had gone higher, but less and less stocks above their 50 days. So while the S&P was holding its 50-day, a lot of individual names were not doing that. And that's the sign of some internal weakness. And that's kind of what you've been seeing here in the last uh, couple of weeks, right? The S&P going to new highs in early May, but less and less stocks confirming that. So Overall, what this tells you is we're seeing a very similar move to what we saw back in January. Now, what differentiates this move right now with what we saw in January? We'd have to break support. You'd have to break the 50. You'd have to make a lower high and then follow through to the downside. That's what we not really got. We did not really get that in January. We did get that back here in September, October. So what differentiates the garden variety 5% pullback, which is what we've seen so far, and something deeper and meatier and more painful is a breakdown of support and that is what I'll be looking for going into next week. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Really appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close, especially on Friday where we have a chance after the Friday close is locked in to take a step back, look at how the markets have evolved over the course of the week, and also answer some of your questions. I think one of my favorite parts of this show is being able to hear from you guys, uh, questions that are coming up as you are trying to analyze charts and trade your positions and manage risk. And uh, we are certainly here to help you as much as we can. Shoot us an email with questions that come up in your normal day-to-day -day process, and we'll get to them in one of our next mailbag segments. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at finalbarsctv. We're also on YouTube, of course, and just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you. We'll hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment uh, early next week. Also, as a reminder, Stock Charts TV is not just live streaming. It's not just on YouTube. We also are on demand from any of your devices. You can go to StockChartsTV.com, uh, the website, use your email, set up a free account. You can also do the same thing on all of the app stores. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let's open the final bar mailbag. These are all questions we've received from you in the last day or two. Let's get to it. Uh, first question, David, great show. Wanted to know what is the significance of 3, 10, 16, 3, 10, 16 in MACD. Thanks and stay safe. Hey, to you as well. Uh, so what does that actually mean? So let's look at a uh, random chart. I have Spirit Airlines up here at the bottom. We're going to change this guy to MACD and we're going to get rid of this one just to clean it up. And we're going to say update. So at the bottom, we're using uh, MACD and the traditional settings, when you look at MACD, MACD stands for Moving Average Convergence Divergence. What you basically have are two moving averages. In this case, and this is what the numbers mean, the 12 and 26 day exponential moving averages. This black line here called the MACD line is the difference between those two moving averages. It takes the 12 day exponential moving average, the 26 day exponential moving average, the first minus the second is represented by this black line. This red line is called the signal line and it's a nine day moving average of the first line that you see. So it's the MACD line smoothed out by nine days. And that's a pretty classic uh, technical indicator approach of having one indicator and then you smooth it out a little bit more. And then you look at when the lines cross up and down through one another. And that's a, that's a standard way of 
thinking about it, the, the MACD indicator was designed years and years ago by Gerald uh, Apple, whose son Marvin Apple actually uh, runs a research service focused on MACD and other things, uh, of course, as well. But he was a uh, his father was a pioneer in thinking about this sort of trend following mechanism and using uh, MACD this way. In particular, when you when you asked about the three, ten, and sixteen, those are not periods I've ever used, nor have I really seen people use them. So I don't I don't that is not a significant set of numbers to me. But that's what the numbers would represent. So in your example, you would be looking at. The black line would be the three-day exponential moving average minus the ten-day, and then the red line would be a sixteen-day average of the first uh, of the first line. And and again, the settings are really flexible. It depends on what you think uh, makes sense relative to the instrument that you're looking at. Next question: Could you advise me how to set up the AAII bull and bear uh, ratio on one chart where the bear chart is upside down? Uh, absolutely. So in the Mindful Investor Live chart list. If we say summary and we look for the one called AAII bull bear with spread, that's this guy right here. I love this trick. This was something I think I want to say Arthur Hill showed me this. He was good at uh, sharing some charts when I was just learning stock charts that um, uh, that that did this uh, this this maneuver. And it's a great way to show like a bullish and bearish combination. Uh, really, really good. There's an indicator called price up down pair, and you just add the first ticker comma and then the second ticker and it automatically inverts the scale of the second one to give this effect and it's a it's a great just visualization to illustrate things like this and and that's how you do it super easy and if you want this chart exactly by the way you can go it's on the mindful investor live chart list you can download this and save it and you, you've got it already built for you next question um a regular watcher show thanks so much looking at the chart of the s p from 2018 to present is there a megaphone pattern developing and if so is it bullish bearish or neutral really good question let's look at the weekly chart here so this is looking at this and we can get rid of um all these just for now to uh make sense of it but you're looking at this basically which is looking at 2018 and you're saying is this a megaphone pattern of higher highs of lower lows and and so the short answer is is kind of is, is the way i would describe it a megaphone pattern usually call it a megaphone top by the way is when you have a big rally and then you have this expansion you know we tend to think of a consolidation phase like a a, a symmetrical triangle or a coil pattern which would be the reverse which would be a big move and then lower highs higher lows and you're sort of narrowing the range that's what you see more often what we're seeing here is more of a megaphone pattern which is an expansion higher highs and the lower low. So the lower end actually follows pretty good a trend line if you take uh, the lows on the S on the SPY here. The highs though have sort of accelerated. And I think what makes me not think of this as a megaphone pattern is the fact that the highs have gotten higher and higher. This is using a log scale. So it's sort of adjusting for the fact that the price has gone up a lot. So I don't I don't necessarily see it as a classic megaphone pattern. In general, what what happens is during the pattern, you would expect it to trade between the extremes. And, and that changes once that pattern is broken. I would argue the fact that we've broken out of that to the upside, I don't think you could call this a megaphone saying that the spies are gonna get back down to 200. Um, that certainly could happen. I just don't necessarily see that as a, as, a, uh, as a classic pattern there. On our chart school pages, by the way, we talk about the megaphone patterns in a little more detail. So if you need more color on that, uh, I would look there. Next question. Uh, let's see. This is kind of a media one, so I'm gonna, media one. So I'm going to summarize it. I'm looking at the history of yield curve inversions in relation relation to SPX performance. I'm currently reading about different Treasury yield curves in relation to stocks. Uh, I want to look at recessionary periods yield curve inversions. Okay. Um, how can I show you this quickly? Two things that I will attempt to show you. First is, can I find this chart that I really want to show you? I have a chart somewhere, and I think it's in this uh, list that actually shows um, stocks and the yield curve, um, but it's using the inversions and it's highlighting. It's a really cool chart, and I just hope I can find it very quickly. And if not, I'm really sorry about that, but uh, but maybe I'll, I'll try to find it for uh, next week's show. Yes, yeah, I don't see it on here. Um, maybe it's on the inner market analysis. That would be the other one I could guess. No, oh, so sorry. Um, I'm not going to find it. But basically, so is there uh, is there something you could you could do? Oh, here we go. Perfect. This is looking at the at the shape of the yield curve using the difference between the ten year yield and the two year yield. And that's a little trick, by the way. If you do one ticker, just the minus sign, and a second ticker, you look at the spread. It really only makes sense with something like interest rates, where it's a percent and you're subtracting one percent from the other. Uh, but here we're looking at the shape of the yield curve, and and basically when 
the yield curve goes below the pink line, that's when it's basically inverted, when the long end is lower than the short end, right? Or the 10-year point is below the two-year point. And if you look, I've actually added the recessionary periods in this amber color. I don't have the most recent recessionary period, by the way, added yet, so sorry for that. But this shows you what has happened. And, and basically, if you think about where this is, this is late uh, 89 into 1990 when you had an inverted yield curve. Recession started about a year later, and this was the uh, sort of bear market phase in 1990. After the market top in 200, 2000, you had an inverted yield curve going into the uh, the market top in uh, in 2000. Obviously, stocks sold off. You see the yield curve uh, back to steepening in a recession soon after. Market top in 2007 to 2008, inverted yield curve just before that. And went up there. So you did have an inverted yield curve just just barely. I mean, almost kind of uh, here, depending on how you, you measured it. Uh, so it is unusual that we haven't had a huge sell off. You know, I don't know if the sell off that we had in 2020 was enough to sort of call that a completed pattern. But you did get a recessionary period. I think you did get a, a pull off in stocks. That's one of the arguments for more of a deeper sell off is because these previous periods certainly had more pain than we've seen so uh, so far in equities. Uh, so that is one way I would do it, this chart. And if you want this one, just shoot me an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. I'm happy to send you this chart uh, link and you can save it to your login and do whatever you want with it. The other thing, by the way, is if you go to charts and tools, there's a really cool thing called dynamic yield curve. You can go back to a certain time and actually uh, the shape of the yield curve, the entire yield curve from the short end to the long term is on the left. And you can look back to like this period. So this is going into the market top in late two, in 2007, 2008. You can see the inversion where the lower end is higher than the longer end. And then you can see the market rolling over soon, uh, soon after. You see the same thing uh, going back to some of these other periods as well and see when the yield curve inverted and what happens to stocks soon afterwards. So that's another really cool, quick way to visualize that relationship as well. That is all the time we have. We have some other great questions. I'll hope to get to those and please keep them coming. We love to hear from you and love to answer your questions on the air. We need to wrap the show though. We'll go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P market trend. This is a market trend model that I've uh, shared with my own subscribers for years and I've followed in my own, uh, my own analytical work. And it reminds me to stay with the longer term trend especially on weeks like this where you had a big sell-off intra-week, but then you had strength going into the close. What weekly close to weekly close does is it tells you to not worry too much about the noise during the week to wait to wait for Friday's close. One of my mentors who was actually on the show last Tuesday, if I remember right, was Jeff Weiss from Clearview Trading Advisors. Jeff is fantastic and taught me a lot about being patient and waiting for weekly and monthly closes. I think waiting for this Friday's close to show that overall the trend is still positive was very, very good. And, and I think, uh, again, the short-term model turned back positive based on the, uh, the strength Thursday into Friday. Chart number two is looking at a bit of an asset allocation look, looking at stocks versus bonds. You know, I think we oversimplify when we think stocks go up or bonds go up, that bonds would be a safe haven if things get ugly. I think this is showing you that even with the choppiness this week, stocks very firmly outperforming bonds. I don't see anything telling me that's going to change. Uh, this would have to stop going higher. That would tell me to start leaning more into something like bonds or, or something like that. Other than that, if the market comes down, where do you go? And I think gold is setting up to, to be a continued outperformer here. Finally, I love reminding that in any market environment, there are usually stocks that are working. So for today's example, stock making a new 52-week uh, high this week. And uh, actually, Friday is a h and block, HRB. This is a sort of a smaller subgroup within consumer discretionary called special consumer services. It's kind of a catch-all for uh, a mix of things. But H&R uh, Block has been in a decent uptrend, especially after the recovery uh, in uh, in January to February. Making new swing highs in February 2021 was pretty significant. From there, it's just been this nice uptrend of higher highs and higher lows. The relative strength has been consistently strong. Those are the kind of charts in general I would have no problem uh, uh, owning. And especially I also like this base, right? If you take the June 20 high and the November 20 high, that was the pullback in February after it broke out. It's just a classic rotation pattern, a cup and handle pattern, if you will, uh, pushing to higher highs. I think there could be further upside there, but I like, like stocks able to make new highs on stronger relative strength, even in an uncertain week. Folks, that is our show. And that's a wrap for this week on The Final Bar. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close. Please keep your questions coming. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email. Also, check out the new Stock Charts TV on demand. 
Go to StockChartsTV.com anytime, set up a free account. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great weekend. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.